it was amazing to, to watch it on a small screen at home, but to actually uh, to see it on the big screen is like it's really, really arresting. How does it feel for you to see it from, from having gone from making it to actually being here on the screen in front of everybody? Yeah, it's good for me. It's nice to watch it with an audience because I think I've been used to... I've spent hours and hours and hours looking at it in post-production and you're mm. just thinking about details, but then you see it as a whole without thinking about like, oh crap, there's a mistake there. Mm -hmm. It just is, means you're able to actually think about it as a whole thing. So yeah, good. Because you finished filming in January, was it? January and yeah, since then it's been post-production, pretty kind of like full on, so. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So I've just realised I should have introduced everybody. That, yeah. was, that, was, that was really rude. <laughs> um, we have Amy Taylor, who is a, a critic, podcaster, editor, lots and lots of stuff, obviously, Rachel, and um, I'm a columnist and I get paid to ask awkward questions and make awkward entrances. <laughs> <laughs> so, post-production since January, that's incredible. So, do, do you feel like some of this, the stress is gone now? You can, can you, this stage where you can just enjoy it now? Yeah, what it is? definitely. I think it's nice. Uh, it's nice, kind of, I don't know, if I think films are weird things where you, you work on different parts of it at different times, yeah. so that every point in the process is, like, compartmentalised so much that you're just thinking like, what colour is everything? Is everything matching in terms of colour? And mm -hmm. I've been thinking about that for about two months solid. <laughs> so like to be able to actually see it with everything brought together is really, really nice. Gosh, well, what a triumph. It really is wonderful. Um, wh which part of the process was most enjoyable for you to do? Wh which bit uh, really stands out for you? I, I like post-production, I think it's yeah. fun. And I liked, I loved working with actors in the shoot. It was amazing. And mm -hmm. it's kind of an amazing feeling to write an idea and then suddenly people are doing it and it's just a bizarre thing where you're like, oh my God, this is inc <laughs> <laughs> But it's really incredible to see things that are in your head kind of coming to life quite immediately. So, mm -hmm. and I think that's what, I like post-production too, because it's the time where a lot's done and you're just pulling it together and you have quite a lot of control in terms of mm -hmm. how it looks and there's all the fiddly bits. I like the details and everything. So, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. So obviously this is a finished product. Can you take us back to when this all started? What kick started it off? Um, so I got invited by so two produ production companies, Hopscotch and MVA, to make the film. And I was invited, um, and I, I liked the brief because it was quite eccentric. I was invited to um, make a film about civilization, but set in St. Peter's Seminary, um, out, which is this kind of uh, brutalist ruined seminary outside of Glasgow in Cardross and m put this together and make it make it for TV, so BBC4. So it felt like this kind of fun idea, and I started thinking about civilization and BBC, and looked back at Kenneth Clark's documentary from the 1960s, Civilization, and I watched like the first episode and was like, oh man, this is interesting. I like his voice. <laughs> I like kind of what his voice signifies, and I could see a vision somehow of just a female, standing in front of the ruins of St. Peter's, speaking with the voice of Kenneth Clark, and I was like, oh, I like that. And so it sort of came from there, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I could pick a more accurate voice if I had to voice the patriarch. <laughs> just, was that quite a deliberate choice then? Did you, did, was that what you, you were hoping would come across with, with having that very well elocuted um, very knowing, very confident yeah. male voice on a, on a very sort of hyper feminine body. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's what I sort of thought. Um, yeah, there's something about him, the degree of certainty, mm -hmm. the fact that he talks about his own opinion as if it's the truth, um, the, that kind of accent as well, or just it carries so much. And I like the idea that you don't need to know who he <coughs> is and you don't necessarily even need to know the connection to get it, you can hear it in his voice and you can hear it in his delivery so um, yeah I like the power that it carries. Yeah that's not a man that's ever had imposter syndrome is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Definitely> not. <coughs> um, your, your work is, um, uh, is so polished and, and so clean and crisp and, and I'm thinking about St Peter's Seminary, I don't mm -hmm. know if, if many of you have seen it as it is right now and mm -hmm. as it's been. Um, Thinking of the contrast there, it's quite like the contrast between real life because real life isn't, yeah. you know, isn't polished in any way. So I'm, I'm just wondering what drives you to create your work in these, um, these really polished sort of clean environments. Um, I quite like, I quite like the polished thing, and I quite like always having a bit of a contrast to it. And I like the idea of creating these worlds which 
immediately register as being like Disney Princess Barbie, so you kind of get that straight off the bat, and without watching it properly, you might just get like little girl's bedroom. Um, but then you watch further, and it's like that kind of starts to unravel, and there's all this kind of darker content in there. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something for me in that kind of glossiness and soft focusness that um, registers as femininity that I'm quite interested in presenting that to people and as a challenge almost that look at this and take it seriously rather than having to I guess talk or make work in masculine colours to be taken seriously so I'm, I'm quite interested in that I guess a challenge to an audience of like this doesn't have to mean what you think it means immediately and this doesn't have to be dismissed as something silly or frivolous mm -hmm. um, but I guess simultaneous with that kind of critiquing that world of Barbie and Disney princess and the aspiration of little girls to be princesses. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. It's almost something we just in inherit and we pass on isn't it without mm -hmm. us uh, even thinking about it. That's why the figurehead's so good because it's a woman but she's basically yakking the pink here and just like <laughs> releasing all this internalised misogyny. Mm -hmm. um, and what I really liked about the piece was it would appear from the kind of setup of the seminary is that these are women that are women of means mm -hmm. and they really want to fit into society better mm -hmm. and in order to do that is they have to change everything about themselves mm -hmm. including losing their autonomy, losing their voice mm -hmm. and that is quite a frightening prospect. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I guess I was looking at a lot of these sort of makeup <coughs> vlogs and vlogs of people who are about to get plastic surgery and things, and there, there's kind of a weird rhetoric around it, which I think is just the double bind of women, where you have to say, I want to get plastic surgery, but you have to say, but only for me, for my own personal reasons, nothing to do with society, this is entirely my own individualistic reasons. And I think there's a kind of depoliticization of the whole thing and the way in which women have to feel under pressure by society and the knowledge that if they did look better, they would get on better, mm -hmm. but have to hide that with this idea of like, oh, it's, it's coming from me. Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking quite a lot about that with the film of things that women experience that, at least when I was growing up, weren't politicized enough. So like food, I guess, mm -hmm. beauty, all these things where you just felt like it was your own personal anxiety. It wasn't anything external to mm -hmm. you so mm -hmm. the sense that these things are you have the means to set that within a political context mm -hmm. what was that? Sorry, that was you a massive, massive spider <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of the patriarchy running the back door. <laughs> Um, it's really interesting what you said there about things that weren't perhaps politicised enough. Sorry, I was looking for this spider now. Thank you. Um, so we're all about the same, the same age, and I, I, I had no idea what feminism was when I was kind of at high school. So like we were like the obviously the suffragettes themes came through like really strongly in the film, which is wonderful because you know it's a hundred years um, since the representation of the People Act, and um, for me, it certainly it wasn't until I kind of came out into the big bad world mm -hmm. that I really discovered that actually it isn't a done deal. There's, there's a lot for us still to do. Was was there a particular moment for you when you you realised that oh God, we've still got quite a way to go here? Yeah, I mean, I think I I kind of had a similar experience to you, where I I got taught about the representation of the People's Act in school and this idea of suffragettes, women got the vote, but it was like women have got the vote, cool, you're sorted. And that was really the feeling that I got when mm -hmm. I was, I guess, educated at school was like, you're equal, you know, get on about, get on with it, don't yeah. complain. And it took me to go to art college. And I think I was really grateful for going to art college because it made me realise that oh, wasn't the case at all. And I remember in first year, I think we like looked at some of Barbara Kruger's stuff and it for some reason just like snapped with me and suddenly every single advert I looked at and every single representation of a woman in a kind of makeup advert it just suddenly read as like oh my god this is this intense level of control that I've never mm -hmm. registered before and that kind of weird sense of like a veil falling from your eyes so yeah. the extent to which I guess which makes me realise the extent to which you're trained not to question these things. And the thing about that act was it didn't give everybody the vote. Mm -mm. No, no. And that's we always go, yeah, it's been a hundred years. Yeah. No, no. no. It's, it's been ninety. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was only if you, you owned property. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. it's it's like you were saying about being a woman of yeah, it's class, it's yeah. money, it's financial, it's everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this was your first full length feature film. Yes. Congratulations. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How did you find it? Was it harder making a longer length film or easier or? Hey, some things are harder and some things are easier. Yeah. I think that um, <laughs> it was, it's nice for me because it's different to a gallery where a gallery you've got the lip and there's a sense that um, narrative is always looping and people can come in at any point and it's like a narrative wise you've got to tell a story or tell an idea in a very different way so it was kind of a strange thing where I guess the conventional way to tell narrative is start to finish but this wasn't something I've ever really done before mm -hmm. so it was thinking a lot about the end really matters the start really matters mm -hmm. and there's no sense that you can hide within the loop mm -hmm. um, so that was yeah challenging but I, I really enjoyed it and mm -hmm. there was a while where I was like it's going to be too short and I was like oh shit it's too long <laughs> <laughs> I think. so there was a lot of that feeling uh, one thing we were talking about before we uh, started this was food. Mm -hmm. The whole thing about how food appears mm -hmm. in this film, and it's not only very phallic and very funny, yes. but it's also the controlling of food. Uh, what, how did that come about? Um, I think I've been interested in that, and I, I like the Yorbach quote and that mm -hmm. kind of whole idea of like fat as a feminist issue, and find this amazing uh, thing out. A lot of the stuff I, uh, the clips and that are from the BBC archive, and I find this amazing clip of Orbach with a kind of full studio audience mm -hmm. of women from Weight Watchers talking about this idea of fat being politicised and it seemed like this was about 25 years ago and I was like this hasn't really moved on yeah. and I don't think I grew up with any idea that you know a concern about your weight and mm -hmm. I think an anxiety about eating is something that almost all women have mm -hmm. and is internalised and I don't think it's something that is really seen to be political mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. that kind of quiet secret thing that women are burdened with so <laughs> I wanted it to be a little bit externalised. Yeah, so yeah. So and I, I think that really comes across in your work as well. So one of the things that really struck me is how so many things that are abstract were made concrete in, in your mm -hmm. in your medium. And because of that it kind of throws into sharp relief just how absurd mm -hmm. it is. Do you, do you know we're we're used to, to reading people like mm. Orbach, we're used to, to talking about dieting and body image and the control of mm. women. In print media, do, do you think that film has a, a role to play in continuing and evolving the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the kind of problem you have, I guess, as like a female filmmaker is that the whole history of film is really like defined around the male gaze and looking at women. Um, the notion of a man looking at a woman so you've got that kind of problem to deal with of the media mom was being defined by this so I sort of w w wanted to think about that and wanted to make it quite explicit in the film where you've got these little cameras I'm filming obviously as a film but then you've got these secondary cameras within the film that are also kind of mm -hmm. surveying the women and they're almost kind of an absurdist embodiment of like a slightly ridiculous male gaze mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think definitely film has to, and female filmmakers have to kind of unpick that and work out, you know, mm -hmm. how you forge a language from a language that is essentially about a kind of certain control over mm -hmm. um, um, women and Im images of women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it you're wanting people to take away from this film? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> 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 to take away from it. I guess I, I, you don't want to be like too grand, but I, I like the idea that with art, or art I like, makes you just see something slightly different and it can be just a tiny little thing in the world that's banal and you're used to seeing but mm -hmm. it just slightly shifts your perspective on it or the next time you see that thing you, you're reminded of an artwork so I hope with at least referencing things that are familiar that it might just the next time you watch a reality tv show you might be reminded of and it slightly shifts something in your perception so um I guess that's why. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. um, we've been talking for 15 minutes. Yeah. So we'd like to open it up to you guys. Yeah. And if anyone's got any questions for Rachel, hands up. Oh, there's a hand at the back. Yes, um, sir. Yeah, I just wondered if you talk about the, uh, the script writing progress from ah. uh, the, um, when you came up with the concept to actually shooting and just how you went about that and redrafts and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. I, uh, this is kind of like my first time of working within this sort of process because I've always like, I've written scripts but never quite of the scale so um, I I guess when I started writing scripts I'd come from making films with like found audio and when you make stuff with found audio you automatically get this quite interesting thing where you can just like jump from one genre to another and you've got this sense of like 
cutting things together. So I've always tried in scripts to kind of keep that. So you've got this slightly disjointed sense of you maybe write a few set pieces and join them together. Um, but yeah, I've kind of like been crash coursing all these like script writing books and things like that, which I, I don't know how much use they are or how much I can get my head around them. But it started to be, a, I guess, a bit of a mashup between what I've learned from art school as a kind of video art method of making film and then more of what I've learned more recently in terms of like storytelling and I guess film film. Um, and I'm rambling, but something I've noticed. <laughs> I think what you're saying there is, is really important as well because it harks back to the point you made about kind of the rules and, and the industry being kind of mm. crafted by men. And imagine a fair few of those script books, et cetera, were probably yeah, written yeah, yeah. by men. So perhaps this is kind of a process of emergent research and finding out yeah, what script yeah. writing means to you as a, as a woman who's yeah. making films as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at like uh, things I've learned, I guess, about moving from what felt like video art to somewhere in between video art and film is that there is they're very similar you can make the kind of same thing and show it in the same way but <coughs> the way it's talked about is quite different and there's a sense of video art and the art world talking about film as what does it mean you know what is it about how does it relate to our idea of society like what's your grand ideas and then in film it's much more like story who's your character where are they going and it's like two quite essential things to think about. Mm -hmm. So I've I found it really useful to like be slightly between two worlds because you can slightly mm -hmm. smash two ways of thinking together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I've got one. Yeah. We When's your next one. feature like yes. film coming? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to write a treatment right now, but it's Are going you? slowly, Amazing. and I can't really tell you anything because oh. it's so bad. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, I'd like to make another feature film, and I think it um, it was a nice experience, and I've also learnt so much. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but I also like I'm making a really wee video just now, so four minutes, and I think that's fun. Mm -hmm. It's nice making things that don't feel like so big mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and this is going to be broadcast on BBC4 is that right yes. which is amazing yeah. um, how do you how do you feel about that going out to a, a wider audience because obviously as an artist I think perhaps your work is is, is facing certain audiences whereas mm. obviously with it being on TV the amazing thing is you can communicate to potentially everybody in the world yeah does I that feel different yeah, I think it's good. I, I'm kind of excited about it and I, I think that um, I'm always interested in getting a bigger audience for what I do and I mm -hmm. think that I kind of made this with the idea that it would hopefully connect with people in TV and or through the medium of TV and I was thinking quite a lot about like TV formats and this strange mashing up of reality TV with like paternalist sort of BBC documentary mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Kenneth Clark meets like RuPaul's Drag Race yeah. or something <laughs> so there's like some strange smash of like audiences um, so I'm really excited about it and I think uh, yeah I, I'm interested to see what reactions come back mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So where are you off to next with it? Is it, is it Glasgow next? Uh, London. London. So London. Yeah. London. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's kids. wonderful. Right, does anyone else have, have a question? Yes, we do. Well, uh, that's uh, a great question, uh, but I was going to ask like, what were the kind of things you were like watching, or what kind of things you were you sort of reading, or what were the influences for like the characters? Because it was like a, like a wee little army, or like a set of like characters, or something. I just, what, what were you like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 like, the concept level, what things were woven into it? Because I was getting sort of themes and stuff, and I just wondered what, you, what was going on. Yeah, what I guess. Looking at and stuff. Oh, that's a good question. I'm trying to remember. Uh, <laughs> I was... Uh, God, what was I watching? I did watch a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race <laughs> and um, America's Next Top Model. <laughs> and I was quite interested in that like repetitive format. So mm -hmm. having a film that's got that reality TV show where you repeat the same thing every episode, but it changes slightly. Um, I also was watching a lot of Handmaid's Tale and I liked mm -hmm. that as a kind of narrative and you're follow following one character. Um, Oh man, I can't even remember. Lo loads of, <laughs> loads of stuff. Um, I guess there's also just like so much that feeds in from other places that um, I aesthetically was kind of looking for that weird mashup between 
I guess this kind of Barbie, I looked at a lot of Barbie toys and this strange kind of plastic baroque thing that they've got going on in mm -hmm. kind of Barbie dream houses and then that against St. Peter's Seminary, this mm -hmm. sort of brutalist architecture that's kind of more in line with the Kenneth Clark era, like that 1960s sort of optimism and um, so yeah, I think lots of things. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any questions? Comments? Yes. <coughs> uh, you obviously aren't very heavy with visual effects. Um, which, what, like, is there a reason you went down that aisle? Was it that kind of idea of Barbie and that kind of life is plastic kind of vibe, or was it just in a budget thing? Or? Uh, I guess I've always worked like that, so it's partly. Um, but yeah, I wanted to feel um, slightly animated and slightly plastic, and yeah, like you say, that it's all got that. Um, that kind of gloss or veneer on it, something that just feels a bit polished and distant. So I want it to feel almost within the kind of genre of fantasy and that um, the colour grade is kind of really apt up in saturation. And mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just, I like that. I, I think visual effects are fun and I think that green screen just gives you again on a budget the <laughs> potential <laughs> to do things that mm -hmm. you couldn't mm -hmm. physically build so um. mm -hmm. I think um, one thing that I noticed from the the, the sort of aesthetic mm -hmm. is that it, it almost brought up the sort of uncanny valley mm -hmm. with me mm -hmm. watching it um, how do you feel about um, making films that make people feel uncomfortable sometimes yeah good yeah that's <laughs> <what's like. laughs> um, yeah, I want there to be moments that you feel uncomfortable and I want there to be that oddness to it. I think mm -hmm. um, you've, especially if you've got this quite benign look or glossy look to it, there's got to be stuff that cuts through the surface and feels mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. odd. Um, so yeah, I think uncanny is good. No, I'm up for that. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions? I've got another one. No, I just wondered if you wanted to talk about like costume design at all, like yes. iconography, like mm -hmm. some of the things that you were Mm -hmm. per purpose of putting in there or, or the process of cho choosing the costumes because they're always mm -hmm. so extravagant and other ones you've got like a like a pastel palette that mm -hmm. always sort of comes through in all of the sort of short films and anything we need to talk about yeah 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 no that's a good question i um i was looking at because i started off looking at lots of like b movies you know with kind of like space worlds where there's like evil women that wear these kind of amazing space costumes and things mm -hmm. so i started looking at that and i think kind of the main character i play had that slightly b movie sort of look with the shoulder pads and yeah. slightly kind of, I don't know, 1960s, 70s space age. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also that sort of Victorian doll, uh, kind of little, the idea of the little girl, which I guess is defined by this kind of Victorian idea of childhood. But then so much of the costumes came from like Japan and China and mm -hmm. that way that um, a lot of that Victorian idea of childhood has been absorbed into a kind of idea of like Lolita mm -hmm. culture and um, mm -hmm. you know women dressing up as mm -hmm. little children mm -hmm. or little mm -hmm. dolls mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a mixture of things mm -hmm. and I wanted the so the man in it is uh, to dress a bit like Kenneth Clark so he's kind of like Tweedy yeah. sort of um, art historian guy yeah. <laughs> so a kind of like authoritative um, old school authoritative outfit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I loved that you, you took those concepts of, of like sort of uh, Lolita type, mm. Sailor Moon type aesthetic mm. and complicated it by putting mm. it in a, like a ferociously feminist mm. movie. I think it's, um, yeah, it, it's just really refreshing to see that being reclaimed by, uh, by women and recontextualised. Yeah, I guess it's a kind of problem of if you're making visual images <coughs> known as a woman, you've kind of got this thing to deal with where you're like, what do I just totally abandon makeup? Do I totally abandon all this girly stuff? Mm -hmm. And then what are you left with? Like masculinity and the idea that mm -hmm. to be powerful you have to look like a man. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that there's just all that ki that stuff to work through. And I wanted in the film to complicate it. So you've got makeup, but there is a sense in which the makeup is this kind of control or form of control but then mm -hmm. also makeup is the thing that gets Siri out of her situation where she paints yeah. on the eyes and that's how she almost escapes the gaze of the cameras mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. so it, it's like everything is more complicated than just a very black and white idea of yes or no or just 
abandon that or keep mm -hmm, it. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, does anyone else have any any more questions? I think was that your timer going off yeah, there? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Well, I just want to thank you again for no, being here with so us much. tonight yes, and for thank you. turning. Thank you.